Hi and welcome to the video. When I bought the Canon RF 100-500mm f4.5-7.1 to LIS lens um, almost two years ago, I was not sure in the beginning if it was the right decision. Um, not because I doubted the quality of the lens, I had already tested the lens for around two months back then, but I was not sure if it would really fit my style of shooting and how often I would actually use it. And my main concern, to be honest, was this f7.1 at 500 millimeters. I was a bit afraid it would be maybe a bit too slow lens. And now that I have used it for really a while, I took a lot of images with it. I want to share my uh, real world experiences, what I liked about this lens, for what I use it, uh, what I didn't like and also to whom I can recommend this lens and to whom I think another lens might be a better choice. So let's start with the good things about the lens. For a lens that reaches 500 millimeters, I need to say it's extremely compact. It's very small, it's lightweight. Um, of course, if you zoom in, it's an external zoom, meaning it extends a bit, but I had no problem with the build quality. I have used it in different con conditions, like on the beach. I used it in the rain, in the rainforest, but also here in Europe. Of course, if there is really heavy rain, like a downpour in, uh, in a tropical rainforest, I use uh, like a lens, co a rain cover to protect the camera and the lens more. But I do this for all types of lenses that I have. But otherwise, I was very happy. I was very happy with the image quality. Um, I think it was the first zoom lens where I really felt, wow, this is up to the level of a prime lens. Um, I had good zoom lenses before, but they were usually a bit shorter, like my 70-200 to f2.8 of the second generation that is behind me. But this one was my first long zoom uh, lens that reaches up to 500mm, where I felt, yeah, this I'm not sacrificing image quality compared to a prime lens. It's really top-notch. Another thing that was kind of important to me when I bought this lens is the big maximum magnification that you can get. So um, the near minimum focus distance is 1.2 meter at 500 millimeters. And this gives you a maximum magnification of uh, 0.33 or 1 to 3. And of course, it's not a macro lens, but it means that you can really get some nice big shots of rather small subject. So maybe I would not go for flies, mosquitoes or other really small things. But if you aim more for a bit bigger butterflies, reptiles, amphibians or even portrait of uh, some ducks or geese, then this lens is really good. Because compared to a traditional macro lens that has maybe 90 or 100 millimeters, you have here the advantage that you can use up to 500 millimeters. So you have a bit more distance between you and the subject. And this can be very useful for animals that might otherwise be scared of you and fly away or just swim away or walk away or whatever. This lens has a dual nano USM autofocus motor and this might sound already impressive but it's crazy fast. I think it's the fastest uh, telephoto lens I have ever used from any manufacturer so far and from what I understand the R5 is not even capable of using the full potential of the, R of the RF100 to 500. Currently I think it's only the R3 that can really make use of this dual nano autofocus uh, motor but already on the R5 it's really like crazy fast. Um, I was taking some pictures of drag flies in flight and here this um, this big magnification comes into uh, play again because this would be something that would not be possible with my 600 millimeter f4 because the dragonfly would just be too small in the picture so for this it was really amazing the autofocus also worked well in uh, different types of conditions also with backlit um, in the forest when it was getting a bit darker I need to say if I was really in a tropical rainforest or it was getting starting to get really dark then I felt like my 600mm f4 still had the edge. This is of course because f4 lets in much more light than f7.1. But the RF100-500 to was still reliable and overall I was very happy with the autofocus performance. And since f7.1 is not a very large aperture, it's true that you get less light. And there I was very happy about the image, uh, image stabilizer of this lens. Of course, this is only important if your subject is more or less still, but I found that with many uh, songbirds, 
uh, mammals, they often are kind of not moving for a while. They kind of stop and if you take a burst of shots, even with a thirtieth of a second, I often got super nice shots, completely sharp, and this just allowed me to keep my ISO a bit lower. The good image stabilizer was definitely uh, welcome for the photography, but even more for filming because there uh, a quick shake might ruin your whole footage. Nobody wants to look at uh, shaky footage, whereas for pictures you can always increase the ISO a bit or just take a burst of shot and hope that one is sharp. For video it's more demanding and in general I liked about this lens this versatility that you have. 100 to 500 millimeter that's a huge zoom range and this gives you just a lot of different options. Again if you think about filming I can do a clip of, of a bird at maybe 100 millimeter or of a mammal. I show a bit of the surroundings, I zoom into 200 or 300 millimeter to just have the animal fully in the frame and then I can zoom in up to 500 millimeter for a portrait shot. So this is really amazing and for filming extremely versatile but also for photography. I used it for example for alpine ibex to show a bit more of the surrounding they live in to show these big mountains and this is something I would have definitely missed if I would have um, went with a prime lens. So I mentioned some really nice things about the lens but there were also some things I'm not super happy about. One thing is that I felt the front element is a bit prone to scratches. I was really treating it carefully, I think. Um, I only have two very, very tiny scratches. Um, they have no effects on the pictures. I mean, I checked, the, they do not affect the pictures. I checked all my pictures also in backlit, no problem whatsoever. But it's just a bit annoying also if you want to sell the lens at a later point. And um, I uh, heard also from other photographers that use this lens that they had similar experiences. Some people were complaining about the, um, the lens hood, that it's a bit low quality. And I need to agree, it doesn't seem like the best lens hood ever made. It takes some um, like marks from another, from items with another color that you might hit like could also be a branch and afterwards your lens hood is brown here or I also managed to get some red on it at some point but usually you can get them out again with a bit of water and pressure. Um, it also t has quite some scratches already but to be honest for me it works. I mean it's just a lens hood. The main Issue, uh, the main goal of the lens hood is to reduce the co or to increase the contrast and to reduce light coming in from the side and it also kind of works as a nice protection for the front element um, because if I go through a forest or whatever and I might hit a branch on accident there is a high chance that this lens hood is just protecting the lens the front lens element. What I think is more important is this cool little window here. Um, this allows you to turn your polarizing filter which is super nice for landscapes because I actually use this lens sometimes for landscapes. Of course not the traditional landscapes with like a wide angle where you have flowers in the foreground and mountains in the background but more if I just want to focus on some peak of the mountains that have some nice uh, clouds around or some hit, are like lit by the very last sunlight or whatever. I also really found this useful for landscape photography and in some situations, for example, like some icicles in a river in winter, I have used the polarizer with this lens as well. You can also, speaking of uh, icicles where you might need a tripod for a long shutter speed, um, of course use this um, tripod color that is included with the lens. Um, by, I mean when the lens arrives it's attached I think. I just detached it because I find it in general for hand holding more compact and more comfortable without it. Another thing I don't like so much is the um, this smooth tight ring. I think it's a nice idea but it happened to me several times that I somehow moved this ring without noticing. I guess just by the way I put it in the backpack and it was maybe touching some other equipment and then it started to move. And when I got it, uh, took the camera out, I didn't realize much. I just took the camera out, put it on the ground, and then you can see what happens if you have it on the smooth setting. Um, the weight of the camera basically lowers um, the lens, which is not ideal. So I would prefer that there would be more friction on that. Something I was also not very happy, um, especially in the beginning, was the position of the control ring because you cannot easily reach it with your left hand, in my opinion. If you shoot like this, it's very hard to reach. At some point I realized that maybe it was meant to be used with the right hand, like with the uh, middle finger or the pinky, I'm not 100% sure. 
This doesn't give you the best control, but it kind of works. But I need to say, since my R5 has three control dials on the camera, and this is enough for shutter speed, um, aperture and ISO, I actually don't use the control ring. So not a big issue for me. But if you are a person that really relies on the control ring, Again, it works with the pinky or index finger, or maybe you also find a way that you can use it with your left thumb, but I didn't find it ideal and I have it actually deactivated on my lens. So what about this f7.1? Is this an issue or not? Um, first of all, in terms of light, I actually found it not to be such a big issue because nowadays um, with the good image stabilization that we have and also with the tools like DX or Puro, Puro 4 that I use quite often, you can see it on this picture that I took with this lens, I used uh, DX or Puro 4 and afterwards the image looks very clean and nice. So I would not worry too much about it in this sense. In terms of background rendering, how is it there? So if you have like a controlled setup, let's say a feeder for songbirds in your garden, I would not worry at all. I actually stop down my 600mm f4 most of the times to, I don't know, f5.6, maybe f6.3. So there is not a huge gap to f7.1 anymore, just because a small songbird at f4, you will not have the whole bird in um, sharp. There will only be a part of the bird sharp, so I actually prefer or I'm perfectly fine with the f7.1 here. In general, for small songbirds, even if I just walk through the forest, it works very fine in most of the situations. Problem is more if you should want to show more of the habitat and put the birds smaller in frame, then the background will be more distracting in some situations. Or if you photograph bigger animals where you have a um, bigger shooting distance and therefore less magnification, there it can also be a bit annoying at some times and to be honest a bit limiting. So it kind of depends what type of photography you do and also how much you are, like how important a clean background is for you. Because I also know that for some people they don't mind if the background is a bit more busy. I prefer a smooth background so this was in some situations like a bit tricky but it worked very well or for example in backlit there are many situations in backlit when I went to the Ibex I took some backlit shots it didn't matter so much if you have f4 or f7.1 or f9 because the background is just some mountain peaks that you see only as a silhouette. Um, so there it's not a problem. Um, and there I was just happy I had a zoom lens and I could like include more of the environment if I wanted or less if I wanted to focus a bit more on the, on the main, uh, well, the main target or the main, the species that is actually in the, in the image. So it really, depends I guess on the situation. Of course if you shoot backlit and you have flares like you shoot at the river or at a lake or the sea and you have these bokeh balls or however you want to call them in the background and especially in the foreground there I really felt that sometimes f7.1 was a bit too small for my taste. So before we continue with tele extenders and some other points, I want to quickly show you some images and videos that I took over the last few years with this lens.
If you want to learn how you can take similar images and how to get most out of your lens, please check out my ebook. I put a link in the video description. So in some situations 500 mm is just not enough, especially if you have small songbirds and here tele-extenders come into play. So this 100 to 500 mm lens can take both the 1.4 and the 2x extender. However, there are some things to be aware of. Uh, first of all, the image quality, at least with the 1.4 extender, is still very good. The autofocus takes a hit, but I also found it still usable. Uh, I didn't use the 2 times extender a lot just because I don't have one and I just loaned one from Canon for a while but I didn't do a lot of shooting so I don't want to mention or to talk too much about it because I don't have enough experiences. Um, the problem that I see with the extenders is that the, if you zoom all the way out in order to have this lens so compact um, the like back element of the lens it, it's almost at the level of the lens mount and if you look at the design of a tele extender it has this tubus that basically goes into the lens and this is not possible with this lens so the only way that you can use tele extenders is to first zoom to 300 millimeters and then you can start attaching it this means two things in practice first of all your zoom range is much smaller so now it's from 300 to 500 millimeters this means if you put the 1.4 extender it's a 420 to 700 millimeters and it also means if now i want to store this camera into my backpack it will take up much more space because i cannot zoom out anymore and that's something to be aware of and i think a reason why I think uh, I would not use tele extenders so often on this lens. Um, on the plus side, it's a zoom lens, so even with the tele extenders, you still have a quite nice zoom range, but it's definitely much smaller than without. For me, this is not so much of an issue because, as you might know, I have a 600 millimeter prime lens, so usually I use this, and that is more my secondary lens, or if I want to go for a short walk along the beach and don't want to take my big lens, then sometimes I took this as well. And in these situations, I took the 1.4 extender, um, was also okay, but for me, it's not the ideal combination. So if you plan to shoot a lot with the extender, I would rather look at the RF 200 bit to 800 millimeter that offers you more focal length without an extender. And actually, in my opinion, works better with extender. But I already did a video several months ago about uh, um, comparison of the 100 to 500 and 200 to 800, both in terms of the sharpness, bokeh, I mean like background rendition, um, autofocus, and also some real world uh, tests and experiences that I had when using both of these lenses in parallel. I uh, put it in the video description. You might want to check it out if you're not sure which one to get. So overall, I think the RF 100 to 500 is a very, very good all round lens. If you want to do sometimes landscapes, you want to do some like amphibians, reptiles, some portrait of birds, also show you more the environment, then for me it's a very good lens. It's very compact and lightweight. As I mentioned, if you need more focal length, maybe look to the 200 to 800 or the 800 f11 if you want to have something less expensive. Um, if you want to buy this lens, I would be very happy if you could check out my affiliate links below. You don't pay anything more, but it would help to support my channel. And let me know what you ex your experiences are with this 100 to 500, why you went for it or why you maybe decided to get a 200 to 800 millimeter instead.